here we go. So chapter 11 is based on, of course, threaded fasteners, um, screws, nuts and bolts and things like that um, are considered um, threaded fasteners. And so we'll go over a little bit of background, um, not even background really. It's not like a history which starts with Archimedes or something like that, but it's more of a just just kind of a foundational background of it. So we'll talk about those and some terms, how to represent them in a drawing uh, with the thread call out and um, we'll talk about the different kinds of threads basically and some common fig configurations and have an assignment. So there we go. All right, uh, fasteners can be kind of categorized uh, in a variety of ways. And um, some of those are uh, where you have permanent fasteners such as welds and, and um, riveting is also a permanent way to uh, attach or fasten uh, two things together, uh, usually two things, uh, as opposed to removable or um, fasteners that can be reused, right? And those are the ones we're kind of talking about with that that have threads to them, but not only, not only, right? So we have screws and bolts and things like that. Those have threads, but pins and keys um, and, and um, there are others that, that can be classified as removable, but don't have threads. So those are um, that classification. Um, and, and we kind of talked about before how uh, industry progresses into standards, right? And, and it just is more efficient, cost efficient, cost effective, and, and, it, and assembly times can be reduced by using, um, and, and turnaround times, you know, ordering uh, similar um, fasteners rather than having to have specialized fasteners every time you build something. So um, again, standardization is, is an efficient way to to, for industries to progress. So uh, one of the major ones anyway. <laughs> so there you go. There's your background. Okay, a, a typical threaded fastener has, has, this is kind of the anatomy of it. Um, it'll have a helical shape uh, board around a shaft, right? Or the body of the fastener. So the cutting tool, basically if this was turned on a lathe or, or even rolled um, or casted and finished, you would have um, this helical um, form that's wrapped around um, some cylindrical body for that matter. Uh, usually cylindrical, it doesn't have to be actually, so um, for different kinds of fasteners. But um, in doing that, you produce a, the, well, some of these, these terms are what we're going to use, right? We have the axis of the thread and that's, that's the center line or the axis of rotation and the body of the the fastener is the basically the undisturbed portion or the diameter of it so that that's typically considered the major diameter which is more or less nominal right so that that diameter is is may not be exactly as it's um, given because uh, it's kind of like a two by four it's not really two or four <laughs> so um, the pitch diameter is, is really the diameter upon which the strength of the fastener is calculated. So that's kind of the, the contact distance or diameter. And then the minor diameter would be along what's, what are called the roots of the threads or the, the smallest diameter that you have on it. So you have the crest diameter, which is considered the major diameter, but it's a little bit smaller than the body diameter. And you have roots and crests, and then you have the included angle. Um, so the angle between two corresponding threads on the, on the, um, in the profile of the thread. And that also leads to the distance between them is called the pitch. And the pitch is interesting because on a single thread, and we'll talk about other kinds of threads like double threads or whatever, but um, one full rotation of the fastener will produce a uh, lateral movement of the fastener by one pitch, right? So the number of threads end up being, uh, or end up corresponding to the pitch of the um, fastener. All right. Um, 
good. Internal threads are also uh, the same way. They'll um, be represented, um, mirror, they'll be like a mirror image of each other um, of the external thread because you're looking at, well, when you see it in section, right? When we haven't talked about sections really, and uh, because that's in the next chapter, <laughs> but if you cut this thing open, you're gonna see the back end of it. And so if I see the, um, back end of the internal thread that should match with the threads coming around the back. So if I have a thread, let me see if I can turn on my little pointer here. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if I, um, if I look at this thread, it actually is going to come around the back here and connect with that thread and then um, that thread comes around here and then that goes back down to here and then around the front here and then back to here, the stuff you don't see basically. And so that's what you see in the internal thread or these, these lines that come across um, behind the external fastener. If you, if you want to think of it that way, that's, that's okay. It also has the roots and the crests that match the roots and the crests of the external fastener. So in the other chapters, when we talk about assemblies where these things actually go together, then, then th that makes sense. All right. Uh, we'll talk about thread forms also. Um, these, these screw threads, this helical ridge uh, produced by wrapping basically some sort of shape around the cylindrical body, um, produces, you know, th these different thread forms actually uh, serve different purposes. And so we'll talk about those. And we already talked about the pitch and the, well, we didn't talk about, well, we did talk about the lead, but I didn't call it that. The lead is the distance the part will travel. Again, when you uh, turn it once, <laughs> one full revolution will, will lead one single pitch on a single thread, but twice that on a double thread and things like that. Because you can wrap, um, you know, more than one, you can offset them by 180 degrees and, and wrap them around the, the, the cylindrical form. Uh, you can try that at home just with a string wrapping around a broomstick and you can do two strings that are uh, opposed, you know, 180 degrees, diametrically opposed, I guess, and wrap them around and they're not going to hit each other and that produces a double thread. So. Anyway, the thread form, there are some basic ones that uh, the most common ones are listed here below. Uh, the unified national screw thread are, are basically triangular um, threads and they have, they have certain dimensions to them as pointed out in the, in the figure there. There's also knuckle threads that you might see like on uh, water bottles. Actually, most water bottles have like a worm thread or an acme thread or a square thread to them. Um, just because it's quicker to uh, put them on. Um, also, or even a buttress thread. Um, a knuckle thread would be like for light bulbs where it maximizes the surface area, the contact, right, for to conduct the electricity between the bulb and the socket. So knuckle threads are interesting. Um, the ISO, the, the metric uh, equivalent of the unified national thread are, are slightly uh, different than the UN or the unified national threads. Acme threads are, are a little more stout and are used for um, um, a higher load um, and, and actually transmission um, of motion rather than just fastening. So same with worm. Um, worm gears or worm, uh, worm drives use that kind of thread form. Buttress threads are meant to uh, provide strength in a single direction um, and so forth. We have Square and American National, so we don't have to talk about all those. But yeah, sometimes if you, if you look at like a, just a water bottle, you might see the kind of thread form it has. I don't know if I have one here. That just presses in. Yeah. I don't have a water bottle. I have a cup. All right, so um, there are three main ways is to uh, represent a thread on a drawing. Uh, you can draw them detailed. A detailed representation shows the thread um, 
in a more realistic manner, I guess, or it shows the, uh, it's not actually accurate, but it shows it more in more detail than the other two. So it's called detailed <laughs> and we'll go over those. Um, the schematic representation shows a, um, well, it's easier to see than to explain, but um, they're just alternating parallel lines showing the roots and the crests basically um, that run perpendicular to the axis of the cylinder. Simplified representation is the easiest one where you just use a hidden line, basically a dashed line to represent the roots of the threads and a thick solid line to for the crest. So here's, here's some examples of that. So in simplified representation, all this is simplified representation. So here's an external thread where I have these, this dashed line representing uh, the roots of the thread and the actual external, the crests of the thread is, is represented by an object or a visible line. Um, on the right, you see them in section, which means it's cut open. And so if, um, but typically you don't, you don't show threaded fasteners in section, but um, if you did need to, you would, it would look something like this where um, those dashed lines would still be dashed and the section lining would be across it. But we'll talk about that more. Um, this is when the end is chamfered also. So really, even if the depth of the thread doesn't, isn't the same as the chamfer of the fastener, you still draw that line across the, from the chamfer across just because it looks fine. Uh, here's an unchamfered uh, view. Uh, usually most th fasteners are chamfered. Uh, there's maybe a few examples where there uh, is, it isn't. Okay, internal threads um, in a hole where a threaded hole in, in the uh, longitudinal view, you would see uh, two dashed lines uh, representing the roots and the crests because they're basically hidden. And in the end view of that, you would see the um, crests basically uh, that would meet with the roots of the external thread. And then the crest or the roots, I mean, of the internal thread as a dashed hidden line um, because they're cut into the part and there's a section view. And then in a blind hole, you would see that um, you would have to drill the hole, basically cut the hole and it produces a conical tip at the end of it. And then the threaded part doesn't go to the end of it because it just can't really. And, and that's what it would look like. So all that being hidden and so you have a blind hole just as normal and then you would have this threaded part cut out of it and this is where the threads end basically right there so all right next as far as the call out goes that how to dimension a thread basically is just a leader with um, these elements in it and they don't necessarily have to have all these elements but um, it's possible that you would see these so the first one you almost always see is your um, pitch or the threads uh, um, per inch basically, or inches per thread really. So if I had eight threads per inch, that's one eighth inch is inches per thread. Um, and then the type of thread, so unified national coarse fine, extra fine. So UNC and uh, UNF, UNEF for extra fine, that would be the series. Um, the classes of fit, basically how tight the, um, the fastening happens. So in uh, applications where it's assembled and disassembled often, you would have a loose fit or um, a, a class two fit for um, a good fit that can be interchanged. And then a three, which would require extra cost and extra manufacturing to get that kind of high tolerance. Uh, or low tolerance, if you want to call it that. And then A and B are for, A is for external and B is for internal threads. So, um, and that's how they're designated. And so your first number that you're going to see is the diameter. The second is going to be your pitch or the number of threads per inch. And the third and fourth are going to be your thread form and series in the class of fit. So here's an example. So right here we have a, three eighths or 0.3, well, it's not 0.375. So it's nearly three eighths. 
um, inch or 0.388 inch uh, diameter, nominal diameter, uh, six threads per inch, and uh, unified national cores, uh, two class two fit, and B is internal. There you go. Isn't that lovely? Here's an example of a metric thread, which uh, doesn't vary from um, that too much, but it has more um, parameters that can be used to uh, for tolerancing, basically. So M, or a metric, basically. There's your nominal diameter, so that would be 10 millimeter. And this would be the thread. Um, this would actually be the pitch. That would be 1.5 millimeters per thread, so or between threads. And then you have some tolerances. So you have your tolerance on your major diameter. Um, and uh, six is an average grade and less than six is a finer fit and greater than six is a coarser fit. And G is a small allowance and an uppercase G is for an internal thread, uppercase H also for internal thread. And so those are your positional tolerances as well. Okay. It's rare to see all that, usually. So here's another example of, of that thread. With some slightly different numbers. Pipe threads are slightly different, even if it's metric or uh, inch based or imperial. Uh, the pipe threads are always in inches. <laughs> So uh, here's a one inch nominal diameter and it's going to have 12 threads per inch national pipe and this is either T or an S which stands for straight or a tapered thread. So tapered threads uh, fit together faster. Uh, you'll see a tapered thread on some pipes once in a while, pretty often. All right, so um, if you're purchasing parts for a company. Um, you're basically choosing by the attributes of size, strength, the head shape, um, and that depends on the application, and also the thread type, which is also dependent on the application, which it all is really. So um, we'll get into those a little bit later as well. Anyway, um, some other definitions of some, uh, just some names of common fasteners. A machine screw is, is maybe the most common kind of screw that you would see. Um, it usually just passes through a clearance hole in one part and threads into the second part. And the head, uh, when it's torqued down, is the head holds that, that part with the clearance hole into place. Okay, um, a cap screw is a smaller version of the machine screw. A captive screw is basically held in place by the part being held. Um, the first thing I think of is a battery door to any kind of electronic part like a Nintendo or something where you unscrew the battery door and it, and it folds open but the screw doesn't fall out because it's been molded around or, or pressed into um, the hole where um, it doesn't fall out. The military uses those also, so you don't lose your fasteners in the field. Um, a self-tapping screw, like a wood screw, is a great example of that, but there's also sheet metal screws that um, have a little cutting head tip on it that cuts into the part. It cuts its own um, hole. Some, some of them, even um, like a wood screw, cut their own hole, but also they cut their own threads as it's driven. Okay, a bolt technically is a screw that has a nut at the other end, so it passes through two clearance holes and held in place by the head of the fastener, um, like a hexagonal head or something, or, or a Phillips screw or whatever, whatever, and we'll talk about the configurations there, um, and a nut at the other end. So, um, and a stud is a um, shaft that has no head, basically, that's threaded into a blind hole usually and um, another plate is has a clearance hole on it is, is passed on top of it and is fastened with a nut on on that side so some some easy examples would be 
well, it's not technically accurate to say the lug nuts on your on the uh, on a car um, and the and the studs on those those aren't really they're kind of like studs but they're not threaded into the other side they're just pressed in so um, but um, you might see if you've ever taken apart an engine the head comes off the head studs are basically threaded into the engine block and the cylinder head is just passed over those um, those studs and, and, and the nuts are what hold it onto place. So if you've ever had to change your head gasket, you would know, I guess. <laughs> All right, we'll talk about head styles and um, drive designs and point styles. And let's see. So here is just some um, drawings of some different common head styles. So um, a slotted, it doesn't have to be slotted. Those, that's actually the drive configuration. Um, but, but the head itself is, um, there's the pan, which has, um, which allows for a deeper head. So slightly more torque can be involved in that. A binding head has a little um, under um, recessed um, underneath the head to hold like wire into place for electrical connections. Uh, flanged, uh, so a, a head that has an enlarged uh, neck to it, basically is a flanged washer head that allows for a greater um, surface area for binding. An oval um, head allows it to be semi-flush with the surface, but also has the depth it needs to uh, for higher torque and less stripping. A truss head is a very common, just just regular um, low torque application. A hex head is a hexagonal shape, usually draw, driven by a socket, and it has a large enough head, and it has enough angle on it to where the tools, like a wrench or something, can be placed on it with um, a wider variety of angles on it. Um, as opposed to a square head, where, which you might see on fences, it's cheaper and you don't need all the clearance because it's out in the open, but in like an engine bay or something like that, you would want a hex head rather than a square head. Okay, a uh, flat head would, is designed to be flush with the surface. Um, so most wood screws are um, that way. A philister head is kind of a combination of a pan head and an oval head where it has um, it's more or less flush. It doesn't catch on um, like um, on the surface. Anything passing by the surface wouldn't catch like clothes or something like that. And it also provides a deeper surface for higher torque. And then the spline flange is good for, you might see those on your seat belt. If you follow your seat belt to the floor or even the seats themselves, you might see that 12 spline flange is for higher, higher torque. You'll see that in aircraft applications as well. Okay, um, yeah, just what I said. Uh, different drive configurations are useful. Um, you have the hex cap or an Allen key or an Allen wrench configuration where you have a, a socketed hex uh, shape a slotted, which is just a bladed screwdriver kind of uh, configuration, or a Phillips. And then you got a bunch of other ones like tri-wing and pentalobe, um, things that, that um, like iPhones have, so you can't get into them without the tool. Uh, they don't want you to get into them, I guess. <laughs> but anyway, there are a whole host of different configurations, but these are some of the more common ones. All right. Uh, the shoulder and the neck are usually enlarged to take up the, so usually, you know, when a fastener is passed through a clearance hole, uh, the neck kind of takes up that clearance to allow for lower shear stress um, or vibration resistance. All right, uh, point styles. Now, this is, this is uh, mainly used in uh, applications where a fastener is passing through like a collar of a hub, um, let's say a pulley on a shaft, and the um, there's going to be a threaded hole in the collar of the pulley or the part that goes over the shaft, and that um, can um, 
a set screw can be threaded into that that has a certain point on it. And these different points allow the that press into the shaft in a variety of ways uh, to hold the pulley on the shaft. So um, these different points, I think I don't have, well, I have another slide that, that shows those, but um, pointed um, or conical, well, let's see. Uh, let's just start with cupped. Basically, they have an indention on them, so um, it gives a circle of, of uh, basically a sharp circle so it can dig into the shaft itself and hold it. And so it's really not meant to be changed out very much because it can, it actually, you know, deforms the, the shaft itself. Um, and so it's not meant to be reapplied. Uh, flat surface is good for um, just locational purposes and is good for resetting um, just using friction. Conical part is designed where um, it either digs into it or fits into a uh, complementary hole in the shaft or a, an indention in the shaft that's already made. So um, given for a specified location. Oval is good for, again, frequent adjustment um, and not damaging. It's a smooth surface, so it's not good for high torque, but it's also good for frequent adjustment. And then you have um, just basically a smaller cylindrical end um, with different lengths on them that can be fit into uh, recesses in the shaft called either half or a full dog um, um, placement. All right, strength. Um, this is where you can figure how, what kind of fastener you need, how many fasteners you need. And this is based on the strength uh, requirements. So whatever load these fasteners are going to be under um, gives, so the strength of the actual fastener, the, the, the strength of the material itself. So it ranges from grade zero that has no set or required uh, strength value to it um, grade one, and this is in thousands of pounds per square inch. It may sound like a lot, like grade one is 55,000, whereas grade eight is 150,000 uh, pounds per square inch. But a square inch is kind of a lot, and um, most fasteners don't have that kind of uh, surface area, or um, cross-sectional area, I'm sorry. So um, Anyway, these are designated by the marks that you see on the, on the head of the fastener. And I thought I had an image of that, but it doesn't look like it. Maybe later I do. Um, if you need to draw the heads, I have this as a reference and it kind of goes over based on the diameter. Everything D is basically the diameter of the fastener itself. So this, um, diameter of the head, or actually the radius of the head, is three quarters of the body diameter. So there's D right here. So if D is 3 eighths, then this would be 9 30 seconds of a radius circle that you would draw for the, for the head of that fastener. So, and so on. There's, you know, two thirds D for the height of the, the height of the um, head. Um, the length is just the length that varies, and then the chamfer, and so on and so forth. And then there's a, there's a neck underneath here with a surface. All right. And yeah, and that's, it's 1 64th of an inch, which you wouldn't be able to see the line thickness would get in the way of that. So you draw it at 1 32nd and so forth. So all these are uh, for reference purposes, as is the next slide, a little more detail on drawing hex and square heads. We'll do some of those. They're pretty fun. We can even make a fastener library of sorts. Here are the point styles um, for different fasteners. I mean, for set screws, mainly. So um, here's an oval. Um, these are all oval, actually. And then here's a half dog point and a full dog point. Um, here's a flat, or and there's a cupped point that actually is indented. And then there's a conical point. So And how to draw them in their dimensions. So we'll skip over that. Okay, so as far as, um, and it, when we get to class, we'll, we'll talk about, um, I have a tap and die set that, that shows how those threads are cut or can be cut. Um, they can just 
be cut with tools. And so the tap drill size is the um, roughly the minor diameter of the thread to where um, it's it's drilled, just a straight hole drilled to where the the cutting tool can fit and cut the cut the threads at the right size. So all right. Let's look at, I don't know if I want to do this as an assignment. So I'm going to end it here. Discard those. And let's look at some of these assignments here in the text. I don't know if you guys can see that. I'm still screen sharing, I think. Can you yeah, see? Yeah, we can still see it. Okay, great. Um, so here are some fasteners that you can just draw. Um, yeah, I think this would be a good first one. So in here, we're going to just draw this H-step threading screw, which um, your the requirements are you're going to show this uh, major this this diameter at um, in detail representation, the middle one in schematic, um, and the first one in simplified, which is just those. Um, I didn't show you a schematic one. I um, wonder why they didn't have that slide. I don't know. Anyway, I'll um, let's let's just give a sketch of that. So I'm just going to share screen as a whiteboard. All right. Guess you guys can see that. <laughs> so if I have a fastener, um, this it's is a uh, pure white. Yeah, it should be. Do you see this oh, drawing at all? No, it's just a solid white for me. Let me try it again. How about now? Do you see the green? Yeah, yeah, I can see it now. Okay, so I'm sketching a <laughs> uh, an external thread, right? There's the chamfer diameter there. There's a chamfer line right there, right? So, um, and we already saw the, the um, the simplified representation, right? And so maybe the heads over here in some configuration over there, I'm not going to draw it. So a simplified representation is just dashed line starting at the root line here and dashed across here. I don't want to draw that. But what I want to draw is the schematic. So I draw the root lines and crest lines alternating, right? So basically at the pitch, so you get the idea and then at some point it ends right so at the end yeah there you go so that's called a schematic representation where we um just show alternating full diameter lines which would be the crests of the thread and then these shorter lines um, representing the roots of the threads which really would go across this line right here, but I didn't draw it that far. Anyway, you get the idea. Okay, let me get rid of that. Um, detailed, okay, and, and we'll have an example where we actually draw a detailed one. Um, in, we, yeah, we should do that. Um, the book also has a representation of that. I guess I could sketch that, that might be kind of hard. So, um, yeah, I'm just going to draw. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Make this a little bit bigger here. So here's, here's my, um, fastener here. Okay. Um, and I'm going to cut out, right? So it gets, it gets cut a, a groove, let's say, and let's say that's the pitch. Okay. <laughs> now opposite it, it's going to, okay, so if I have that touching there, um, 
I'm going to offset that by half, right? So it's actually going to touch. So it'd be something like this, not that obvious, but so they're staggered by half a pitch, basically, from the top to the bottom. And they should be because they come around, right? So I would connect the crests with each other. And I would connect the roots with each other. And it'd be at an angle of half a pitch over. Right? And so forth. I didn't quite get that. Oops. Um, yeah, that would be. Let me erase that. <laughs> Draw the line. Well, that's nice. Yeah. Could draw straight lines, even though they're not exactly straight lines, are they? Um, these are. In, in reality, they're curved lines because they're helical. Anyway, I could go on. And then, you know, I would, I would remove that guy right there and that guy right there and I would chamfer that off and we'd have ourselves, yeah, that would get chamfered off a little bit. Right there. Well, maybe not that far. Maybe something like that. And then I would cut that off. Anyway, as the chamfer goes. So that's a detailed, this would be a detailed representation of the thread. So we'd actually use the pitch and the angle of 60 degrees and so forth. And you could even, you know, um, a lot of the threads are, are cut across. So you'd have two uh, root lines and two crest lines, or perhaps that would be filleted at the bottom and stuff. But anyway, a detailed representation doesn't need to go that into that much detail, just that that's good enough. So, all right, sound good? So, uh, stop that. Let's go back to the problem. And so that's what we're gonna do is show a detailed representation on this diameter and a schematic and a simplified on this, on this screw, so and a nice little hatch pattern for the diamond neural on the, on the end. And then dimensioned, of course. Um, and that'll be our first assignment in this chapter. Sound good? Sounds good. Yep, sounds good. Forgot to click share. So yeah, that, that's it. So, all right, so we'll end it here and um, stop sharing, stop recording.